I do have a second book coming out this winter. It's called How Old Is the Universe? And I thought I'd try to get you excited enough about the book that you're all going to go out and buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing we need was, oh, there we go, is baked potato. <laughs> so we, in fact, do have a baked potato tonight. What do we know about this potato? It's just a baked potato, normal baked potato. What can you tell me about it? It's hot. It's hot. Good. It's a carbohydrate. I don't care about the carbohydrates. <laughs> Actually, that is important. You know what it's made of. It's made of carbohydrates. And it's hot. What's going to happen to this potato over the next 20 minutes? It's going to cool down. You think it's going to shrink? Yeah. It should. It should. And if it were made of the right materials, things that cool off do shrink. My bet is that you would not be able to measure the difference in size between the hot baked potato and the cold baked potato. We know the temperature that we need to use and the process we need to use to heat it up to a temperature which you want to eat. However, when it comes out of the oven, it's a little bit too hot to eat. So you're going to set it on the table and it's going to start to cool off. Do any of you know the temperature of the potato when it comes out of the oven? My information says 210 degrees. That's the internal temperature of a baked potato. We know the temperature of the baked potato when it comes out of the oven. I set it on the table and it starts cooling off. I could measure the rate at which it cools off. What I could do is I could set it on the table and I could wait half an hour, and I could take its temperature. We bake our baked potato 450 for an hour. We have an internal temperature of 210 when we're done. We've made some measurements. That's our starting point. We know it, it's going to change, given enough time, from that 210 degrees to room temperature. So let's call room temperature 70. That would be really nice if I could use my air conditioner and get the house down to 70 right now. <laughs> it would cost me a fortune. So this baked potato at my house will get down to about 76. <laughs> but we'll go with 70 because it's actually going to make the math easier, which you don't have to do. <laughs> I picked an amount of time for my baked potato to cool off that will also make my math easy. So I'm going to say it's going to take the baked potato 2 hours and 20 minutes to cool off. So how many degrees did it drop? 140. And how many minutes did it take? Hey, easy math. <laughs> now, someone mentioned that my potato is going to shrink. That's a really important point. I'm going to contend, for purposes of tonight's argument, that my potato won't change in size. You can measure the size of your potato and you remember how to do this, drop it in some water, measure the amount of water that comes out of the pitcher, and you can compare before and after. See if you can discern a difference in size after the potato cools off. My bet will be that none of us could actually measure that difference in size. So I'm going to contend that my potato doesn't change in size. So what do I now know? I know that the temperature dropped 140 degrees in 140 minutes, which means I have a cooling rate of 1 degree per minute. I can actually learn something really important. I can give you a baked potato that's come out of the oven at some time in the past. We know that when it came out of the oven it had a temperature of 210 degrees and you're going to make a measurement and you're going to find that the potato right now is 150 degrees. I want to know how long it's been since that potato came out of the oven. Wow. One hour. It's cooled off 60 degrees. It's been 60 minutes, cooling off one degree per minute, 60 minutes old, where age is measured from the moment it came out of the oven. One of the ways we can measure the age of the universe is doing exactly this, but for objects known as white dwarfs. The star at the bottom right, which you're now seeing again, is the brightest star in the northern sky, Sirius. This is a close-up of Sirius, if you will. You have a bright star in the middle, Sirius. You also have, down to the left, 
this little guy. Sirius B. <coughs> Sirius B is the one we're interested in. Sirius B was inferred to exist in the 1840s. An astronomer by the name of Bessel, Friedrich Bessel, watched the motion of Sirius night after night, week after week, month after month, year after year, and what he saw was Sirius moving through the sky. These other stars didn't move. Sirius was moving. But it wasn't moving in a straight line. It was doing this wiggle, this slalom, up and down. And Bessel said the only way Sirius can be doing that is if there's a second star in that system. And those two stars are orbiting each other. In 1862, another astronomer, a guy named Alvin Clark, was able to detect the actual image of that second star. In the 1910s, other measurements were finally made to measure the temperature of both of these stars. Now, astronomy is an odd science in that we actually can't take a thermometer and stick it into a star. The only way to do that would be to get the star and put it in my lab, and that would be a little hot and uncomfortable. <laughs> we can't play with the stars. We can't manipulate them. If I were a chemist, I could put compounds in my lab, mix them together, see if they explode. If I'm a physicist, I can put things in my lab and weigh them or do whatever a physicist wants to do with those materials. If I'm a biologist, I put things in a petri dish and watch them grow. If I'm an astronomer, I just look. <laughs> Astronomy is an observational science, but amazingly, we have figured out how to take the temperatures of stars. From other physical laws, from the temperatures, you can figure out the sizes. And also, from the law of gravity, as you watch these stars orbit each other, you can measure the masses of these stars. How much do they weigh? How much stuff is in those stars? And a century ago, astronomers figured out that this star called Sirius B is the size of the Earth with the mass of the Sun. The Sun is equivalent to about 300,000 Earths. So take 300,000 Earths, put them together, you get our sun, our star. But now you've got to squash those 300,000 Earths until they're the size of this planet. That's a really dense object. That's a really bizarre object. Astronomers didn't know what to do with it, but it was fairly bright, and it was really small, and it got the name White Dwarf. So Sirius B is a white dwarf, and they're the objects that we're interested in. Once we learn enough physics, you can read the book. <laughs> Astronomers have figured out what white dwarf stars are. They're dead stars. The sun will become a white dwarf star at the end of its lifetime. You don't have to worry too much. It's going to be maybe two or three billion years from now. <laughs> so you know, go home, you can sleep. <laughs> but the sun will die eventually, and when it dies, the remnant that's left behind will be a white dwarf. That dead star will squeeze itself and squeeze itself and squeeze itself and get smaller and smaller and smaller. And if nothing stopped it, it would squeeze itself into a black hole. But there's a kind of pressure that exists inside white dwarfs that stops the star from collapsing that resists gravity and stops that white dwarf from collapsing any further and it does it when that object is about the size of the earth. At the end of the day what we have is an object the size of the earth with the mass of the sun which can only do one thing, cool off. It has no source of energy anymore, it has no way to manufacture heat anymore. This star is done. It's dead. There's nothing it can do except cool off. And the pressure that stopped it from disappearing into a black hole will not let it get any smaller. Its size is fixed forever. But its temperature is not fixed. It's going to cool off. And we know from basic physics principles 
how stars live and how stars die so we know what temperature the white dwarf will have when it becomes a white dwarf. When the star dies and this thing is born as a white dwarf, we know its temperature and we know its size. And if we know its size and its temperature, we know how much light it gives off to space every second, which means we know the rate at which it cools off. It is no different from the baked potato. It's an object whose size is fixed with a starting temperature and a cooling rate we can measure and understand. Therefore, I should be able to measure the age of the white dwarf. That's the key. So what do I need to know? I need to know the starting temperature of the white dwarf. I need to know the current temperature of the white dwarf. I know how to measure that. I need to know the rate at which white dwarfs will cool off. I can actually measure that. I can also calculate it from basic physics principles and find out whether my measurements match my calculations. And they do. And that's pretty nice because it makes us think we actually understand what's going on. <laughs> and we know that the size of these things don't change. It is absolutely identical to the baked potato. So I can calculate the age of the white dwarf. The age of the white dwarf is not identical to the age of the universe. Because the star had to be born and then it had to live and then it had to die. The universe had to be born. And at some point the galaxy had to form. And at some point stars had to form in the galaxy. And some of those stars will become white dwarfs. If I find white dwarfs of a certain temperature, I know the age of that white dwarf. If I measure white dwarfs with lots of temperatures, I know the ages of lots of white dwarfs. So what do I actually have to do in order to pull this off? I need to make a bunch of measurements of stars. I need to know how bright they appear to be. How do I do that? I go out and look. Oh, that star is bright. That star is the apparent brightness of a star. I can measure that quantitatively, how bright the star appears to be. I need to measure the temperature of the star. I know how to do that. I need to measure how far away the star is, the distance to the star. We know how to do that. The book actually tells you in detail, but not with equations, how we do these things. Because what I want people who read the book to understand is not the answer, but really how astronomers get there. How do we measure A, and how do we measure B, and how do we put A and B together in order to understand the temperature of a star, the distance to a star? So that you're convinced that astronomers actually know what they're doing. And if it's a white dwarf, I know its temperature and its true brightness, which tells me how fast it's going to cool off. And from that, I can measure its age. The very oldest white dwarfs we can measure are 13 billion years old. 